thanks for coming. Um, today we have a, a talk by uh, Carlo Heisenberg from the IPHD satellite. Uh, and the title is An Actonal Approach to Gravitational Scattering and Waveforms. Thank you very much for accepting our invitation, Carlo, and please take it ahead. Thanks, thanks for the invitation. And uh, yeah, let me uh, let me start just by mentioning sort of the main topic that is going to be uh, the, the center of this uh, journal club, which is, um, uh, well, the idea is to review some recent developments in uh, uh, scattering amplitude approaches to uh, calculation of gravitational wave observables. And in particular, I will focus on this uh, iconal uh, approach, which uh, as we will see has to do with the idea of resumming uh, the scattering amplitude in the classical limit, and uh, and we will discuss how how these ideas can be applied to calculate both some uh, information about scattering uh, dynamics, in particular the scattering angle or the deflection angle, and uh, uh, about uh, more recent developments about the gravitational waveform itself. So this is going to be based on some recent works in collaboration with uh, uh, Alessandro Gergudis and Rodolfo Russo. And in fact, I should also emphasize some um, um, some other work that appeared uh, in I mean work, working in parallel with our uh, uh, in in parallel uh, with our collaboration uh, in this uh, arc number here. And if I manage to get there, uh, I will mention some more recent more recent developments that have to do with angular momentum and with the uh, soft theorems and the zero frequency limit of the uh, energy spectrum. And of course, I will uh, inevitably skip many details uh, throughout the talk, and especially uh, about the introductory part. Let me refer you to this uh, to this review that um, uh, we had with uh, Paolo Di Vecchia, Rodolfo and Gabriele Veneziano, really about the gravitational iconal formalism more more in general, with respect to what I will be able to um, talk about today. So um, yeah, the idea is to start with uh, just a few words of introduction and motivations. And then we will mainly focus on this uh, uh, simple classical observable, which is the classical impulse, which has to do with determining the, the scattering dynamics of the two objects. And uh, uh, and then we will go to the waveform. And as I mentioned, uh, something might follow about uh, uh, soft slash static angular momentum losses if, uh, if we have uh, time. And by the way, if, uh, feel free to interrupt and, uh, um, and ask questions and uh, make this uh, as interactive as possible. So yeah, just this uh, first uh, intro, let's say, just to set the stage for, for the ensuing presentation. So in principle, the problem we are interested in uh, can be uh, stated in a very simple manner. We are interested in what happens when we send in um, uh, two objects, let's say two compact objects with masses M1 and M2, uh, which interact gravitationally, we say we send them in with some initial separation, say B, roughly speaking, in the transverse direction. These will uh, uh, interact, so they will in particular deflect, and uh, uh, so they will have some trajectories that depend on these initial velocities and the impact parameter. In the meantime, they will emit gravitational waves, which our uh, interferometry uh, experiments are in fact able to measure in the case in which these two are merger events. And uh, and so basically we are interested in learning about, about all of this, about the dynamics of the objects and about the dynamics of the emitted gravitational field. Now, of course, this is easier said than done. Uh, so to, to, to have some angle of attack to this problem, we usually focus on, on some limits. Well, one limit is uh, is in fact very much appropriate for any type of astrophysical object, which is the so-called classical limit. And, uh, and this essentially means considering objects which have a mass such that the uh, 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 quantum wavelength, uh, so this h bar over m, is much smaller than the classical size that they have, the gm, say roughly of the Schwarzschild radius. And in fact, if you try to plug in typical astrophysical values for this value, for this quantity, you find that this is roughly 10 to the 78 or 79. Uh, and, and therefore, well, the classical limit is very much appropriate for this kind of object. And more or less to simplify our life a little bit, we, we are going to stay in a regime in which gravitational interactions are weak. This is the so-called post-Minkowskian regime. And uh, and indeed, it means simply that the objects are so far apart, so B, the typical separation is very big compared to the typical sizes, so that we can expand in a weak field approximation. So 
this is going to be our, our weak field or perturbative parameter if you want. Now, <clears throat> as I mentioned, the key idea we will explore in this presentation is uh, uh, whether or not we can extract this uh, uh, information about this regime from, uh, from scattering amplitudes. And, uh, and essentially, uh, one issue um, uh, already, uh, already appears from, uh, from what I've written down in the sense that usually scattering amplitudes are organized in a, in a perturbative expansion in powers of G, the Newton constant, which is the coupling, right? And, uh, and in particular, one assumes that G in all the dimensionless combinations in which it can appear is small or gives rise to a small parameter. Whereas we see clearly from here that in our, in our problem, we have a, a large parameter that involves G. So in a sense, this, this is a non-perturbative regime. Um, as far as the scattering amplitude calculation goes. And in particular, this arises because some powers of GM squared will appear at various orders in the perturbative expansion, and these cannot be assumed to be small. So eventually, GM squared should cancel out. Sorry, cancel. When looking at, at the quantities that we are interested in, in particular, the deflection angle should not have any scaling with respect to this quantity. And there are essentially two, well, there are several ways, but two, two ways we will compare today. Uh, in order to get there are, are the following. One is to consider uh, what sometimes is called is in-in formalism or an observable-based formalism, essentially. And then there the idea, this is an idea due to uh, Kosauer maybe and O'Connell, uh, sometimes shortened to KMOC. And there the idea is that this uh, unwanted, let's say, or singular ratio will cancel out in observable. So the key property that uh, that that they showed is that uh, observables are are nice in the sense that to order order by order in the G expansion you will only find after I mean possibly after non-trivial cancellations you will only find powers of the small uh, the small parameter G m over b if you want which is small let's say in in this P m regime another idea that we will look at is the is this uh, iconal exponentiation. So there, the idea is that uh, the amplitude itself is not really a nice object in the sense that we were saying, but it has a nice property, namely that it exponentiates. It is dominated when written down in terms of the right variable. Uh, it exponentiates in terms of phase delta, which itself has a nice, uh, a nice uh, expansion in this limit. So to leading order, it scales like this GM over H bar, so it's very big. But then, sorry, H bar square. But then it receives corrections that are sized by the small parameter gm over b, gm over b squared, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And from the um, and from these phases, we will see we we can retrieve information about the classical observables. Um, another another quantity of interest, just to set I mean other key let's say parameters will be important in the following are uh, something that I will call sigma, which is essentially the the relative Lorentz factor associated to the to um, incoming objects, and this will be generic since this post minkowski expansion does not assume a specific valid validity regime as far as the velocity is concerned, but we will uh, eventually be interested in considering also its, uh, uh, its limit as sigma goes to one, which corresponds to comparing with the so-called post-Newtonian. Excuse me, I have a question. Can you just clarify with me, please? Are you, yes. are, you are saying that the phase shift in the iconal that we goes as one over h square gm over h square is, it, is that the expansion? Yeah, exactly. In fact, we will we will give an example shortly. I don't remember that. That's why I'm asking. But yeah, exactly. To leading order. Then is... How do you define if that the h go to zero? Classical limit h go to zero. Classical limit is defined by this inequality here. So GM squared over H bar, large. Does that answer the question? Sorry, I don't think no, I can I see. I don't, I don't, the... I don't usually, I'm not seeing it well, uh, because usually one says the classical is when H, H bar goes to zero, no? Right, right, of course, indeed. Uh, as you can see from this inequality, if you formally send H bar to zero, this quantity becomes very large, right? Right. 
But of course, we cannot take a fundamental constant of nature and send it to zero. Right. right. Again, so then for... basically, when h equals to zero, the classical action becomes very Exactly. Large. It's a way of saying that the relevant, uh, yes, the relevant yes. action scale in your problem is very large compared yes, to h yes, yes, yes. So I'm saying that gm squared is the relevant action scale, if you want. Yeah. Very good. Sorry. Thank you. No problem. And then uh, another, well, another quantity of interest is the typical frequency associated, say, to the uh, to the gravitational wave. Let's say that uh, a typical graviton, in a sense, has a frequency omega and some direction and mu. Again, this omega, or more precisely, the dimensionless combination omega b, will be again generic for us in general. But we can be interested in taking omega b to zero. And this will be what we call the soft limit. So when we look at the among the uh, you know, spectrum of emitting gravitational wave, we look at the low frequency band of uh, of the emitted uh, of the emitted waves. Okay, very good. So this was just to sort of set the stage. So the first example I wanted to introduce is this uh, impulse, or if you want the deflection angle. And uh, geometrically, this is nothing but uh, really the deflection that each body experiences. So say this is the incoming momentum, and this is the outgoing one, say P prime. This impulse is going to be, sorry, this quantity here. Or equivalently, as long as the system is conservative, in particular, the examples at the order of the examples we were going to be looking at, this is equivalent to get, giving the uh, deflection angle, right? P prime, theta. Very good. So, how does one go about performing this calculation and uh, making a connection with amplitudes? Well, one way is to let me start by this uh, KMOC idea. So, the well, the idea is to start from an in state, which is a superposition of two these two objects with a given impact parameter. Let me be a bit schematic about the, the details. And with some definite impact parameter B, which for me is oriented towards particle one, just to be precise. And then the idea is to consider uh, the variation of any observable. In particular, we'll be interested in the momentum observable, say, for particle one. But in general, the variation is going to be the expectation of this observable O in the out state, minus this expectation in the in state, where the out state is determined from the in state by using the S matrix or the S operator. Then we let's let's specialize this to the to O being the momentum of particle one. Let me note it by capital P one mu. So then our delta O is gonna be delta P one, which I will abbreviate as Q. And this is nothing but P one minus one. Then we can use the fact that the S matrix, we usually decompose it in terms of one plus IT, with one being the completely diagonal part. And, and in this way, you can see that this becomes I in P1, sorry, T in minus i in t dagger p1 in, and then there is a piece which is quadratic in the t matrix. Now, we, we, we recall that for us, amplitudes are nothing but the t matrix elements, right? So up to stripping off a delta function, so these objects will be linear in the amplitudes, and in fact, this will be quadratic in the sense we need to insert a completeness relation right in this sandwich here, and this will give us something quadratic in the amplitude. More precisely, let me let me draw a picture just to make apparent my notation. Our incoming moment will be p1 and p2, and the outgoing one p3 and p4. Here, everything is regarded as formally outgoing, although p1 and p2 are the incoming ones. This is going to be a convention for the so-called momentum mismatch or momentum transfer, if you want, in this amplitude. So I'm not going through details, but essentially inserting these wave packets here uh, does nothing but inserting the uh, Fourier transform with respect to this Q. I will define it in a 
uh, momentarily. So this is going to be, as you can see here, P1 in this point here is inserted and measures the momentum of the out state. So for me, this is P4. So P4 mu. While here, the rest simply defines the uh, the amplitude, right? In T in is just this part, this Fourier transform I was mentioning the amplitude, which I will denoting by this blob here and is a four point amplitude. So let me say four point amplitude plus here instead P1 is inserted before. So it measures the momentum of the in state. So P1 and the flip of sign is, is again due to this convention I was mentioning about the um, out versus in. And now the amplitude appears with the star, right? Because we have a T dagger. And then finally we have plus, and then we have to insert the, the completion, completeness relations I was mentioning. So we have an I, and then let me, let me be a bit schematic. There is an integral. Then uh, there is an integral over the on shell free space that measure this uh, insertion of the, that uh, labels the insertion of this completeness relation. So let me, let me abbreviate it with the, with the drawing. So these are again four point amplitude with momenta P1, P2, P3, P4. The, the only difference is that we have a momentum over which we integrate L and, the, and this momentum I label in, label in this way. So L minus P1, L plus P2. So again, these are P1, P2, P3, P4. And then we have to remember this operator here. P1 now measures the momentum inside the, the blob. So here, L minus P1. Very good. So again, this is, uh, I mean, people familiar with amplitude for sure uh, don't really need this explanation. This is just a shorthand for multiply to four point amplitudes in, multiplied by the on shell phase space measure and integrate over L. Very good. So now uh, let me define for completeness what this FT is. This is just a Fourier transform in the space orthogonal to the incoming momenta, say. And here we see that there is a key simplification, right? Now, going back to, to these regimes I was talking about, uh, let me remind you that B here is the largest length scale in the problem, and therefore we are all interested in the value of this, uh, of this Fourier transform for very large B. And this naturally translates to very small Q in the Fourier transform. And in fact, we can be even a bit, a bit bolder than that uh, in the sense that on not only small Qs, but in fact, we can drop anything that is analytic in Q squared because in the Fourier transform, we will only contribute to something that is localized in B space. So it has only support, let's say, as a delta function uh, of B and this we can safely disregard. So we are interested in small Q and in fact, non-analytic pieces in this Q squared. Now, of course, here there would be additional cuts in which you can insert more than just two particle states. There will be insertion of three particle states uh, in this uh, in this cut here. But for for the for the order at which I present the calculation, these do not play uh, any role. So let me let me just write plus other cuts. Very good. So let's let's play this game at the lowest order possible, just to. Uh, Maybe let me delete this, it can be a bit confusing, just to see what, how this works in a, in a simple example. So the simplest case in which we are staying at lowest order in the coupling. So these are just the three level four point amplitude. And here we can safely disregard this cut, which would be at least of one order more in G. At this order, as you can see, we just reconstruct P1 plus P4, which is Q. So we just end up with the so the so-called 1 PM. So at leading order, we get the so-called 1 PM impulse and this is nothing but i for a transform of q mu times the four point amplitude which is okay more precisely a function of p1 p2 and q say so now we uh, okay the, the expression for the three level four point amplitude is simply given by a single diagram so even i can calculate this uh, Feynman diagram 
And the result is the following. Where here I'm already expanding for small Q and neglecting pieces that are in fact of order Q to the zero, so analytic, again, in this Q, Q, Q squared variable. <clears throat> now what happens is this, uh, this Fourier transform of Q mu times this function can be, of course, written as the D mu of the Fourier transform, right? Well, uh, pulling out the Q if you want, according to the usual rules of Fourier transform. And, uh, and the remaining Fourier transform of one over Q squared is actually elementary, can be evaluated directly by, if you want, by Schwinger parameters or um, Feynman parameters. And, and the result is the following. Where the absolute value is four G M one and two, Sigma squared minus one half, now I'm setting d equal four, b square root of sigma square minus one. Yeah. And this is in agreement with the results that were already known in the literature, in the GR literature, I don't know, I guess from the 50s, if I remember correctly. And uh, well, this gives you a way of deriving it from an amplitude if you if you have this uh, in, inclination like us today. <clears throat> Are there any questions? No. Very good. So now suppose we want to go to next reading order now. So here we have to be a bit more careful. Like first we have to include here the one loop contribution for this amplitude here. And then we also have to include this cut over, over here. So this would be the order G squared if you want. Ah, by the way, here are, we are in a position of, of checking that what we are saying makes sense, right? So the idea is that the absolute value of this Q, let's say divided by the mass or by the initial momentum if you prefer, should be small, and indeed, as you can see, it's case like GM over B, so it's proportional to the small Post-Minkowskian parameter we introduced. So we are indeed calculating something that is a small deflection. So if you want, this would be roughly the deflection angle. More precisely, you have to divide by B in order to get to, but sorry, by P, the momentum, in order to get the deflection angle. Suppose now we want to go to next leading order. So as we were saying, we have to, to include two pieces. One is this, uh, Um, is this uh, one loop amplitude. Now, the one loop amplitude can be split into two parts, a real part and an imaginary part. The imaginary part can be actually fixed in terms of cuts itself, much in the same way as this is a cut. You can fix this imaginary part. In fact, it is given by one half the same cut that appears here. So you can use this property uh, that, again, just follows from the unitarity of the S operator to write our observable in this form, I Fourier transform of two pieces. One is the, I mean, similar to the one we had before, Q mu times this real part, plus another piece, which is a combination of the cut I had written out explicitly in this page, and the one that comes from the imaginary part of the amplitude. Let me write it down separately, this S mu, which is really an integral over L of one half Q mu minus L mu, and then the uh, the four point amplitude. Let me let me write it down instead of using the blob. So P one P two L A four zero. So another one evaluated at P three P four or Q minus L. Now. <clears throat> The, the first piece is, is rather simple. Again, uh, uh, well, rather simple up to uh, calculating the amplitude. At some point, there is a, an amplitude calculation that you need to do. I will not redo it. It's not as simple as just the three level uh, one. You have to work a little bit. You can reconstruct, for instance, the integrand for this one, one loop amplitude. The, the one that is relevant for this non-analytic bit can be reconstructed just by a single uh, generalized unitarity cut if you want this one and where these two are are the ones relevant for the you know for this exchange momentum that gives the non-analyticity in q squared and uh, and the result is is known in fact it was uh, 
calculated uh, um, a few years ago, and it's uh, again a function of q squared. Instead of being q, q squared to the one one over q squared, like here, it's one over square root of q squared, but it proceeds more or less in the same way. And the calculation of this piece is gives rise to the following expression. Q two PM, where Q two PM is. Let me at least give you the final result: three pi g squared, one and two, one plus and two divided by four b squared, sigma squared minus one, five sigma squared minus one. And I think this result was derived instead in the 70s in the GR literature. So right. we are a bit closer. So I think you have another question here. Yeah, sure. So right, you are you are you are is that scalable, correct? Are Sorry? You... Sorry, I think the connection is breaking a little bit. Apologies for that. Can can you listen up? Huh? Yeah, now I am hearing clearly. Your external particles are scalars, and you yeah. assume the minimal minimal coupling. Yes, exactly. Sorry, I should have said that. Indeed. How, uh, how, how is the if you introduce non-minimal coupling or vector like if photons? How, how, what will happen? Yeah, yeah. Uh, you you will have to include uh, additional interactions. So besides the the vertex, I mean, in, including here, if you have additional non-minimal interactions, you will uh, need, in particular, in the one loop. Um, and uh, in fact, there are there are studies of that. There are two directions essentially. One interesting class of me, I mean, uh, additional couplings. Let me say, are due to the inter uh, I mean, in, in, to the presence of spin. So, um, so there, there is there is an issue of what what exactly is the the spin that you want to use for depending on the object. So, of course, we are taking an EFT approach to this, right? The reason why I was focusing on scalars is that okay, to leading order, it's only the scalar that matters because it's it's uh, you know the one that dominates in the long uh, in the long distance approximation. Then if one goes to go beyond the leading order, the other effects will start being important, and then it starts being important. For instance, whether you want to describe a, a Schwarzschild black hole or a curved black hole, or if instead of a curved black hole you want to describe a spinning neutron star, then you will have spin couplings and additionally tidal deformation couplings. So for instance, you may want to introduce additional couplings of the form uh, 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 Riemann square times the scalar field square, which will source these, uh, uh, these tidal effects to leading order. And, and there are several works in these directions. But for today, let me focus on the scalar ones, yes. So this is one piece of the answer. What about this other guy here, this S mu? So this guy is a bit more, uh, is a bit, I mean, we, we can also calculate it directly if you want, but it's, uh, it's instructive to, uh, to use the, the form in which it was written. So the form as a cut, as you can see, and you exploit the fact that we are taking the Fourier transform of this cut, which as you can see from the expression is essentially a convolution, right? What happens to leading order? is that uh, uh, the Fourier transform diagonalizes this convolution. And in fact, you can show that that result is, uh, is zero thanks to, the, to this prefactor here. So in fact, this is one point in which we see the cancellation of these um, um, un unwanted or dangerous, potentially dangerous pieces in the, in the answer, because one can check that uh, in the classical limit, this, these two amplitudes would generate something that is of order one over h bar squared. But this cancellation, I, I mean, I'm, I'm describing to you without actually doing the calculation, guarantees the cancellation of that. But after this cancellation, one is left with a finite, uh, with a finite result, and the S takes the following form. So let me introduce a notation for uh, for the combination of the velocities that I will define in a bit.
And let me also shorten a bit the notation here by, by not writing down all the arguments of the A0. And this V12 is defined in terms of of the four momenta, sorry, of the four velocities of the um, of the initial particles. Where these V V one two check are defined in such a way that V i dot V j is equal to minus delta j. It's just a choice of basis with respect to the incoming velocities V1 and V2 of, of the particles. So <clears throat> then again, this phenomenon I was mentioning uh, kicks in. So as you can see here, we really have now the convolution of these two objects, A0 L and A0 Q minus L, Q minus L. So now that we have to take the Fourier transform, this really diagonalizes the convolution and we find that I F T, I S mu, which is the combination that eventually appears in the impulse, I, I, takes the following form, Q1 PM squared. So as you can see, each, each piece is precisely the guy that we calculated at the previous order, right? Q mu A Q, now we have A L times L, etc. So this is why you get this Q1 PM squared here. So let me let me summarize the answer and then compare with with what we will get from a different approach. Q up to now is minus b mu over b, collecting everything. We have the one pm piece from the previous calculation, the q two pm from the first part of the second order calculation, plus this v check guy. Let me put it here. So this is the correct result up to uh, order G squared. Then we will have our G cube contributions, but for, for today, let me uh, let me stop here. Now, suppose that we want to take this other, uh, this other approach. It is based on the iconal uh, exponentiation. So the statement there is that if you take this, one takes this Fourier transform we defined now directly of the amplitude of the four point amplitude, this is, uh, this can be written as an exponential, and uh, this uh, the, the property of this exponential is, is precisely the one we were saying earlier, that this has a, an order g piece plus an order g square piece, there will be corrections, and to order, to leading order, this is very large. I mean, the overall dependence is very large, but then, well, there is actually a log b, be more precise. And then there is a correction, which is actually small compared to the leading order, if you want. This is a nice property, but this is also useful in the sense that we can use it now going back and undoing this Fourier transform. We can rewrite the momentum space amplitude as the inverse Fourier transform of this. And, and since this exponent here is very large, we can uh, approximate this uh, integral by the, uh, by the stationary phase approximation, and this fixes for us the impulse to be the derivative of the iconal phase with respect to the impact parameter. Very good. So how, how does this calculation work where you have to calculate the amplitude at three level and at one loop and compare with this uh, iconal resumed form. So what happens is that to leading order, so we, more, more explicitly, we will have FT of A04 plus IFT of A14 plus higher loops. And on the right hand side, we will have one plus two i delta zero plus two i delta zero squared over two factorial plus two i delta one plus higher orders. So by comparing left hand side and right hand side, we, we see that the Fourier transform of the three level amplitude is this delta zero. So the leading order right hand phase is just the Fourier transform of the, uh, of the three level amplitude. Whereas as the next to leading order, as you can see, there is a bit of a, uh, I mean, there is a bit of a reshuffling in the sense that before identifying the Fourier transform of A1 with the correction, you have to subtract from it this delta zero squared divided by two factorial, right? And in fact, you can show, so let me write it down, minus i over two, 
2 delta 0 squared. And this is the correction. So you can check that, uh, in, again, by unitarity, this piece just subtracts the imaginary part of the one loop amplitude. So one is left with 2 delta 1 being just the Fourier transform of the real part of the one loop amplitude. And now using the, the equation to get the, uh, the impulse, we find the following result for the 1 p.m. and for the 2 p.m. So this is just the derivative of the corrected of the correction to the phase, and this is what we called 2 p.m. earlier, you remember. So in other words, writing down the full result up to 2 p.m., we simply find minus b mu divided by b, q 1 p.m. plus q 2 p.m. plus order gq. So now we have a problem, right? Because if we compare now these two expressions, we see that they are different. On the one on the one hand side, we got this expression, which seems to be proportional to b mu without anything else. This was in the iconal, let's say, framework. In the other hand, we had we had this piece, but we also had an additional piece that came from the cut. So what what is going on? Well, the the, the answer of this sort of small puzzle that I decided to use to sort of make the presentation a bit less boring is the fact that the B appearing in this formula and the one appearing in this formula are not the same, actually. So more precisely, I should have introduced two Bs already in the first slide. So one is the so-called um, iconal impact parameter and the other one is the, is the actual impact parameter associated to the incoming state. So let's say this is P1 and this is, sorry, P1 for me is always oriented out even if it's in. So this is what, let me call it BJ to distinguish. And the other one is this sort of average variable, let me call it BE it's for iconal. And uh, so this would be P2 say, and then let me introduce, also introduce some for, for later, some additional P tilde and P tilde. So as you can see, there are two sort of natural reference frame. If you tilt your head a little bit to the right, I guess you will be in the frame which is anchored to the incoming momenta and the incoming impact parameter BJ. And this is what the um, KMOC calculation uh, lands on. So this is really BJ. Instead, the, the answer in the, in the iconal um, in the iconal framework lands on the expression written down in terms of the iconal variables. And, uh, and in fact, you can sort of already see that this is correct from the drawing, if I didn't uh, draw it too poorly, because it's clear that eventually B E must be the one aligned with Q, right? By, by symmetry, uh, Q is in fact parallel with B, not with BJ. So of course you are free to write down Q as an expansion in terms of BJ and P1, P2, or this B1, B2, but of course, it will be slightly uglier. That's what happens here. Very good. So a sort of this is uh, uh, one of the key the key messages that when you compare two different frameworks, you you have to be careful because they naturally land onto slightly different sets of variables. And sort of with this um, this example for the impulse, uh, it will be uh, a way in which I will essentially try to skip many details of the of the formalism for the waveform, which is what I want to discuss next. But for which, as we will see, a very similar mechanism is at play. So are there any further questions on this before moving to the waveform? And uh, I guess then I won't have time to discuss about angular momentum, but that's fine. It would be another seminar in its own, probably. Can you repeat again? I didn't understand very well. The, 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 the French line, the French are the same. Right, just writing different variables. Is that the Exactly. So then now, now that I specified here BE and here BJ, you can check okay. that these two expressions are exactly the same. Okay. Yeah. 
Very good. Now, what should we do if we want to calculate the waveform instead? Well, again, the formalism, let me focus again on the KMOC approach first. Then remember, we had to insert this uh, observable operator. Here, the operator we want to insert is essentially just the gravitational field, whose uh, TT projection is, uh, is essentially what our LIGO and Virgo measure. where this integral over k is just a shorthand for the phase space integral. Well, let me stay in d dimension for the moment. So we, what we want to insert in this uh, KMOC calculation is really out h out. And then we assume that there is no radiation in our incoming state. So, um, so let's say minus zero, just to remember that we should subtract the amount in the in state, but this is just vanishing. So, okay. insert... yeah. H is the of the matrix. H is just the, yeah, the canonically quantized graviton field, if you want. And, and this it will give us. The fluctuations around flat space of the matrix. Precisely. Quantized around flat space, yes. So this is just going to be K out plus complex conjugate. So then we can focus on this building block here. And then this is precisely related to the fluctuation around flat space as follows. So G mu nu minus the Minkowski metric. You have to remember there is a normalization because, well, this is the canonical field instead the metric is the dimensionless field. And this is the, the relation. And in fact, our, our interest is in this field evaluated far away from the source in the sense that we are taking the position X at which we evaluate the field to be T plus R, R, N hat, where N hat is a direction, and take R to infinity for fixed T and N. This is the so-called limit to null infinity, right? In which you just flow, uh, follow the out outgoing radiation. So in this limit, this uh, quantity reduces to the following one. In practice, this integral over k simplifies. You can uh, evaluate part of it by um, a stationary phase approximation again. And this w tilde is going to be our waveform. So this is related to this a expectation of A in the final state as follows, minus I out A out. So again, we can relate out and in using the S matrix and decompose the S matrix as one plus IT and we find, of course, A cannot act on the in state because we assume that there are no gravitons in the in state. So we, we can only put it here. And then there is minus a piece that involves the, the part quadratic in the T matrix. Very good. So let me let me define again what these wave packets do, this in wave packets do is to introduce this Fourier transform. So let me now focus on the object that appears inside the Fourier transform, just as we did for the impulse. So uh, as you can see, uh, from this expression here, the first piece will be just now uh, an amplitude with the in, in, so having two incoming massive particle states and two outgoing massive, massive particle states with the addition of a, of a graviton. So this is really a, a five-point amplitude now. Again, one, two, three, four, plus additional graviton, let me say k, with the moment in k. While here we have minus i and inserting the uh, the completeness relation, we, we we might insert two particle states, three particle states, and so on. But here again, only the two particle states with matter. If you stay, if we stay at one loop, and for today this will be enough. On top of that, we we need to have an additional emission of a of a of a graviton from inside the cut, right? So this is just minus i integral. And here the graviton is emitted from here. 
minus i other cuts that are not important for today. Sorry, was there a question? Uh, no. no. Okay. Very good. So now exactly in the same as we did before, let's let's start from three level and then move to one loop to see what happens. So at, at, at lowest order, leading order, our W0 will just be the three level five point amplitude. So nothing in particular is happening here. So this is a way of deriving from KMOC uh, the fact that the waveform at leading order is just a Fourier transform of the three level five point amplitude, very good. At next to leading order, we have to consider the cut. So let me denote it. Now I am switching more and more, as you can see, from the equations with symbols to equations with blobs, which is a bit quicker to, to draw. But now here, this is the one loop amplitude, and these are this is a cut built with a 5.3 level amplitude and a 4.3 level amplitude. Now again, we can use the property that the uh, amplitude, now let me write it down explicitly. The amplitude is again the real part plus i over two and the sum over all the cuts. Now it's a bit more interesting because there are more cuts that one can build with the same external kinematics. There are these two. And then there are other two. Sorry, let me draw it a bit better. Where the first the first two again include the same ingredients as this one, so a 5.3 level and a 4.3 level with massive states. Whereas these two cuts in the second line involve a sub-process, which as you can see is, if you want, the gravitational analog of a Compton process, but now in which a graviton scatters off a massive particle. So these are sometimes referred to as Compton cuts. Now, as you can see from, from the comparison between these, these two equations, now our W1 is going to be, well, exactly the same. So let me use this nice function on the iPad. except that it will flip the sign of this guy here. In fact, this was emphasized in particular in a paper by um, uh, Caronuo, uh, Giroux, Misera, Hannes, Dottir. So this is the final form of the W1. And the W1 is the guy whose Fourier transform would give the, I mean, gives the, um, the first correction to the uh, waveform in the PM limit. Now, before moving to the sort of the punchline of this, uh, let me mention one one point, which is the fact that these uh, cuts here are in fact infrared divergence, are in fact infrared divergent, and and these ER divergences um, take the form minus i over epsilon, if we work in dim reg and epsilon is our dimensional regulator, times some function of the velocity times the three level amplitude or the three level kernel, so this guy here. And, uh, and the reason for that is uh, essentially what uh, Weinberg explained to us in, in his paper in 1965, that uh, one can derive this by considering the uh, very soft or infrared gravitons that are exchange between the um, the uh, lines of the corresponding three level process and uh, and they take a simple form which now uh, here I'm writing a schematic form here times the three level amplitude itself now this for us is important because if we go back to this expression here we see that the effect of shifting t the time to t plus delta t, if one expands, is precisely of this form, right? If one expands this exponential, it will give, give something, in particular, if one expands it with something which is of order g, it will bring down something that is precisely of this form. So in other words, I, what I'm trying to say is that ER divergence is exponentiate. And can be reabsorbed by a shift of the retarded time. You 
by having this expression of gravity. Sorry? I'm sorry, I, I really can't hear. Could you again come a bit closer to the mic? Because earlier okay. it was. You never have in this expression loop with gravity. This expression is true only in gravity. This is what you mean. Not like the diagram that you wrote. Yeah. Our loop diagram, the, the legs are always. Yeah, so the, sorry, maybe I should have been a bit clearer. The, the solid lines are the scalars and the wavy lines are the gravitons. So for instance, in this in this drawing here, one, two, three, four are the scalars. One and four are the massive with masses and one and two and three are the one with masses and two and the wavy line is the is the graviton. So this is the one with momentum but, K. I see this as a two to three scattering where one of the particles is the graviton. Exactly, so it's a scattering of two scalars which also emit one graviton in addition. Yeah, but but then in the higher order, uh, the tab loop, you never have the loop of gravity, right? I'm sorry, but really, for some reason, the audio connection. Do you is have a, a, a gravity in the loop? Gravity is not normalizable, right? So you still. St ah, yes, yes. Indeed, indeed. So uh, there will be UV divergences that would need to be renormalized in the standard way, but this will only be in terms that are uh, short range. So you remember at some point I said that we are only interested in the long range contribution, which are non-analytic in Q and therefore give right to long range effects in, in position space. So those will not have UV divergences. And these are the ones I'm focusing on here. There will be objects, say, for instance, of this type, say, in which these two lines really touch, right? So these these might have infrared diver also UV divergences, but but those are not uh, are not relevant for the for the Fourier transform. I mean, after the Fourier transform, they just give some localized contribution in B space. Okay, thank you. Yes, true. Instead, the IUR divergences we care about, but we can deal with them in this way, which by the way was discussed already in the in the PN literature. So it goes back to papers by uh, Ross, Porto, and collaborators. Yeah. So the, the reason why I wanted to uh, mention this is now the final form of our waveform is the following, W tilde now is the Fourier transform. So written down in terms of P1, P2, Bj, and K is the Fourier transform of, now let me use the, the full blob to denote the three level plus the one loop. And then these guys here uh, plus possibly higher order so since here we are looking at the canonically normalized this will be seven half corrections you do the seven half okay now this is the form of the of the calculation that you want to do if you stay in this uh, let's say KMOC basis or in this basis anchored to the initial um, to the initial momenta and the initial impact parameter. What we what we showed and, and has been cross-checked now in several different ways is that uh, if you are instead happier with working in this iconal frame, the expression simplifies a bit. In particular, you can simply disregard these two cuts that appear in the first line, much in the same way as we could disregard the cut for the uh, for the impulse calculation. And there is also I half, of course. This actually comes in addition with with an additional uh, i delta t omega. So with with another shift, let me say plus shift in time. But as we as we already said, this is actually an infrared divergent piece, which is not unobservable in any in any case. So very good. So this is somehow the punchline of what I wanted to present in this second part of the waveform. The idea is that if one works with this more iconal, say, variables, the expression of the integral simplifies. And uh, now concretely, what we use this for is uh, is the following. We, we have used this uh, expression to perform calculations in the soft limit. 
we remember omega b equals to zero. And, uh, and in this limit, it's interesting uh, to do two things. The first one is to check against uh, universal predictions, in particular due to Sahu, Sen, uh, Saha, and collaborators that are called universal soft theorems. And in particular, fix the order one over omega log omega and omega log omega squared in the soft expansion. And for this, we find perfect match. So the prediction coming from amplitude agrees with the general prediction coming from soft theorems. Another thing, of course, is to go beyond these uh, sort of universal logs, sometimes called, and calculate uh, new expressions for. Uh, say uh, omega to the zero, this at three level, and omega log omega. This is the, the first piece that is non-trivial in the sense that it is not already known thanks to these soft theorems. And in fact, it depends on the detail of the process. For instance, uh, it depends in particular whether the states have spin or not, whether they are minimally coupled or not. So this is really, a, let's say, a piece that probes the actual dynamics of the process. And uh, another thing that we did was to consider instead the uh, the low velocity limit or the pn the post newtonian limit sigma going to one and and this is also interesting because in this rim limit we can compare with uh, the so-called multipolar post minkowskian method which is the standard method to actually calculate waveforms that is used now for LIGO and Virgo for the, by the GR people. And this is based on the idea of decomposing the waveform in terms of multiples. And uh, there is a systematic way in this small velocity, velocity limit of calculating the multiples that uh, build this asymptotic waveform in terms of the multiples that are given by the matter source plus those of the gravitational field. And, uh, and here the comparison is subtle. And uh, eventually the resolution uh, uh, of the tension that seem that there seem to be between the two sets of results is that the two frame the two the two results are formulated in two different frames. So first there was actually some confusion, and this is why I'm actually emphasizing all this uh, between these two frames I'm using here. So this rotation by theta scattering over two, if you prefer. Uh, but once one writes both, in fact, the MPM result is already written in this uh, in this icona-like basis, uh, if you will. But there is an additional uh, issue, which is which has to do with the uh, BMS frame, the same BMS super translation frame, and and again, uh, the, what what happened is that uh, I mean, historically the results were written down into different super translation frames. Super translation frame. These are um, sub, these are uh, transformations that have been pointed out in the sixties by. Uh, Bondi, Messner, and Sachs, and uh, and comprise additional symmetries that uh, asymptotically fed spacetime has in addition to usual uh, translations, rotations, and boosts, and uh, and they take this form. A B will be the projection of the waveform on the tangent space of the sphere, so A and B are say t ten phi if you want. And these d a d b are again derivatives on the on the celestial sphere, where this t n is a function of the uh, of the angles, and in in particular the supernormalization that we need to go from the amplitude frame, if you want, to the one of the MPM calculation is the one that has been pointed out by Veneziano and Vilkovisky for let's say independent reasons. Yeah. Oh, d a dot n divided by M A Veneziano Vilkovsky. Maybe let me make a comment before uh, before concluding. So um, so one way of understanding why this uh, super translation is needed is the is the fact that the amplitude calculation done in the standard way 
would not in include this piece here, which as you can see does not depend on T, the retarded time. It's a purely static contribution, if you want, to the gravitational field, which is determined by the moment of the incoming particles. And uh, well, there is actually a debate in the in the GR literature what super translation frame is more natural, what is uh, has better properties, but to some extent, I mean, to, lar to a large extent, this is actually a freedom of, of, your, uh, of the choices that you can make. And, uh, and uh, one way of, uh, of seeing that you need this is that to go from the uh, expression that does not have the static piece to one that does have, you have to perform the super translation. But the puzzling feature, at least at first, was the fact that we were not looking at the static piece at all, neither in the NPM nor in the amplitude side of the story. And, uh, and the reason what, why this transformation is still not trivial is that, of course, it also has this other piece here, which, as you can see, um, does affect the time dependence of the waveform, or the, sorry, if you, if you prefer in, uh, in, uh, uh, in uh, frequency domain, it would affect the omega dependence beyond the omega equal to zero piece. And, uh, and in fact, it's easy to see that the first order at which it appears in the soft expansion is precisely this omega log omega, which is the first one that we studied in the, in the first paper. So maybe just to wrap up, um, let me say a couple of words to mention what, what points we touched and some future, um, some future directions. So we, we discussed in some detail how one can extract information about classical observables from amplitude, in particular going through uh, details of the calculation for the impulse, the two to two, uh, dynamics, in particular the deflection angle, and we saw how, already there how, how one can be a, has to be a bit careful in comparing amplitude-based results using the iconal framework and using the KMOC framework, in particular the fact that they appear in written naturally in different sets of variables, and then we we went through some more recent uh, incarnation of this comparison, which uh, which has to do instead with the uh, leading and subleading uh, wave waveforms. And, uh, and, and we saw how eventually the comparison was successful, not only between the two amplitude methods, but also with these uh, uh, independent techniques that have to do with soft theorems on one hand and with this MPM uh, methods expanding in the post-Newtonian limit on the other one. So um, uh, at the present stage, of course, it would be interesting to, uh, uh, to have more control on the analytic expression of the way from beyond this limit. And as always, to go to the to the next order, uh, maybe a couple of more, let's say, conceptual points points that I would like to advertise are the uh, the idea behind this exponentiation is sort of interesting from the theoretical standpoint and for the understanding of the classical limit, as we saw. And in fact, there is a way of, uh, although I didn't talk about it today, of understanding also the calculation of the waveform in terms of an upgraded version of this iconal exponentiation, which goes under the name of iconal operator. And the natural question, of course, is whether this exponentiated form holds, again, even beyond the one loop case, and it would be interesting to study different setups and different, um, different processes. Another issue is, uh, uh, is related instead to these logs. So as I mentioned, there, is, uh, there are expressions available in the literature for the first three uh, leading logs, let's say. But recently we came up with a, with a proposal for, for all terms of this form. In the, um, in the 2 to 2 process, we have several cross checks of this expression, uh, independent also done by other groups. So this makes us sort of confident that it could be correct, but of course it would be interesting to have a derivation and, and uh, naturally to extend it beyond the, um, the 2 to 2 particle case. So these are essentially things that are interesting for us at the moment. So with this, I would like to thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Kyle. Uh, are there any more questions? Everybody's very tired. When the phase shift is operator, I remember Veneziano had these old papers. This allows you to have uh, like different external states, right? And then you can have. Exactly. 
like not uh, sc not elastic scattering, right? Is that precisely precisely the idea is to is to go beyond this four point amplitude. So here I'm writing down this exponentiation just for the four point uh, two two two, so elastic process. But the idea is to promote this operator. Where, let me sketch it. The idea is to go from this two delta to e to the i real part of two delta and an operator part, which has this a and a dagger. Uh, well, plus emission continue, yes. And here, uh, this a is really the uh, this five point amplitude, or more precisely, would be the waveform in general. So this this formulation is equivalent to uh, to the one that we saw in the sense that we we can use it to match two amplitudes and derive the ingredients for this guy from the elastic two to two amplitude, the ingredient from this guy from the inelastic two to three amplitude with one graviton emission, and in principle one one can then use this expression to derive other observables, in particular um, the angular momentum which we didn't have to talk about the wave the um, radiated energy momentum and the angular momentum, but to some extent this is an ansatz. I mean, it works up to all the orders that have been checked so far, but uh, yeah, I was mentioning it would be interesting to understand it more deeply. But it's very much inspired by the older uh, Venetian et al. proposals, of course. Yeah. Okay. Uh, yeah, so if there are no more questions, let's uh, thank everyone again.